So for today's video, we're going to talk about elements, subatomic particles, and ions. So elements are going to be units of matter that cannot be broken down to similar substances. But what is matter? So matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. Uh, matter can be in three different forms. We could have matter in a solid or a liquid or a gas. So elements are going to be units of matter. And there's lots of different elements. There's 118 of them on the periodic table. Uh, elements, each of them are going to be different. They'll each have their own chemical properties. They are going to be on the periodic table given a symbol. So many of these symbols are going to be English origin names. Um, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen. And the symbol for oxygen would be an O on the periodic table. A C on the periodic table for carbon. H for hydrogen. A few of these will be um, different origins. So for instance, sodium, for example, instead of an S for sodium being the symbol, it is an Na because natrium, the Latin origin for the word for sodium, is what is going to be used for its chemical symbol. And there are other exceptions to potassium and um, iron are also going to have different origins with a different symbol. Out of the elements, the living things on this planet are going to have some common elements, um, such as hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen. These four guys are the most common elements in the living things. So out of those four, we have four of 11 of them are called principal elements in the human body, for example. And elements that we don't use a whole lot, but we still need in the body would be called trace elements. So atoms are going to be the smallest unit of matter that's going to retain the properties of an element, the things that make the element what it is. And atoms are going to be composed of subatomic particles. There are lots of different types of subatomic particles, but we're going to talk about three of them specifically today. And these three subatomic particles are going to be protons, neutrons, and electrons. So protons are going to have a positive charge. So we can remember that, that protons start with a P and they have a positive charge right here. Electrons are going to have a negative charge. Protons are going to be in the core or the center or the nucleus, if you want to call it, of an atom. That's where the protons with the positive charge are going to be located. They are going to have a buddy that is going to have a neutral charge. It's not going to be positive and it's not going to be negative, and those are going to be neutrons. So the protons and the neutrons, they are going to be in the nucleus right here with the negative charged electrons floating around the outside. If you think of it as a planet in a solar system kind of model, um, the electrons are orbiting around the nucleus or the core of the atom. Another thing to note is that atoms are electrically neutral. For every proton that we have here in the core of the atom, there should be another negative electron out here. So if we have two protons in this example, we are going to also have two electrons here to balance them out. That will make every positive and every negative equal. We will have a neutral electronically neutral. So University of Colorado Boulder has a cool animation out that I like to show all of my students to try and explain again the subatomic particles that make up an atom. So again we talk about there are three particles. There were protons, neutrons, and electrons. And remember the protons had a positive charge and we remember that they went in the middle in the nucleus. And remember these guys were always electrically neutral so for every positive proton we have to have a negative electron. And now you can see at the top, we're a neutral atom. We are going to add a neutron in there. The neutrons in general are about the same number as protons. They may be less protons, or they may be a little bit more than the protons, but in general, you have about as many protons, uh, about as many neutrons as you have protons. And to be a neutral atom, every proton will have a corresponding electron that's going to make the atom neutral. Now if you notice when I added the second electron here, let me remove it again, we have one proton in there and that made up hydrogen and we could see on the element in the upper right hand corner you can see the symbol for H hydrogen is on the periodic table. When we add in the protons that proton number is the atomic number of this element. It's what makes this hydrogen. 
if I change and add a different proton to it, I made a totally different element. Now I've made helium. And that's all because of the protons that are found on that atom. So we have two protons now, we have two electrons, and we have created helium. You can see it's in a different place on the periodic table over here on the right-hand side of the periodic table. This guy is a neutral atom, and its electron shell, this outer shell here where the electrons are located, are full. So this guy, helium, he's a noble gas. We'll explain that later on. But we can see in this example that we can just keep building them. We'll add another proton. Let's create something else. So now we have three protons, um, and this is going to create lithium. And we want to have for every proton, right? We need to have an electron. And now we're neutral. Our charge is neutral. And we can add in the subatomic particles. So we mentioned that there were 118 elements in the periodic table. Every element behaves differently. And every element is going to have a chemical symbol, an abbreviation. So in this example, we have carbon. And we can see its chemical symbol is the C written right here. There are some other terms that we're going to need to know. So we can see this term over here on the far left is atomic number. Atomic number is going to equal the number of protons in this element. An atom of carbon, for example, has six protons. That's its atomic number. That's what makes carbon carbon is because it has six protons inside of its atom. Its atomic number is six, the number of protons. The mass number is going to equal the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So pretty much what's in the nucleus, what's in the core of that atom of carbon, protons plus neutrons is going to equal the mass number. Isotopes are something different. They'll be the same element, but they'll be slightly different versions of it. So here we have two examples of carbon. We have carbon-12 and we have carbon-13. Remember on carbon, the mass number is this guy right here. So we know that there are six protons. It's what makes carbon carbon. And down below is going to be the mass number. This, again, mass number is protons per neutrons. So if we have a mass number of 12, that means we have six protons and six neutrons. Over here on this different isotope of carbon, we have six protons and seven neutrons to have a mass number of 13. These are isotopes, different versions of carbon. And then the atomic mass is just an average of the two of these different versions, the average of all the different isotopes of an element. So here we can see another example. Instead of carbon, here we have hydrogen. And hydrogen, we can see, will have one proton, and then it has its neutral electron over here, one positive proton and one electron with its negative charge, and that will create a neutral atom here. So we've got our one proton and we've got our one electron. And then other versions of hydrogen will have alternating numbers of neutrons. Maybe one has one neutron, maybe one has two neutrons, maybe one doesn't have any neutrons at all. So let's go to our UC Boulder animation and check this out. So with UC Boulder's animation on isotopes, we can see we have a small periodic table in the upper right hand corner. We're going to see our symbols and how often this element is abundant in nature. So the last time we saw on the previous slide that we were looking at hydrogen and we mentioned that hydrogen has one proton and that's its atomic number. So we have the atomic number of one for the one proton. Our mass number is the number of protons plus neutrons. Right now, currently, we have protium. It just has the one proton and zero neutrons in there. Protium has no neutrons. So just protons alone gives us a mass number of one, which is the same as, it is, as its atomic number right now. But what if we go from protium and we add a neutron? Now we made deuterium. This one has a mass number of two. Remember, one proton and one neutron, mass number of two. Before, when we had protium, this was the most abundant type of hydrogen, the most abundant isotope. We can see on the right-hand side that it says 99.9% .9 of the time, we're going to see protium out in the environment, out in nature. If we look 
for deuterium, this is 0.01% of the time we'll have this different version of hydrogen. And if we added a second neutron for a total mass number of three to get tritium, this is so minuscule that it, it's just a trace isotope and it's unstable. If we switch to carbon, another example from our previous slide, we had carbon 12. So we have, again, if it's at a mass number of 12, that means we have six protons and we have six neutrons in this core here in this atom. If we make a different isotope of carbon, let's make carbon 13. We can see its mass number is 13. The abundance of this isotope is only 1%. What if we added another neutron? What if we went for carbon 14? Now it's even less common. It's just a trace percentage. So we can see how often these things occur in nature. And then we average them up between carbon 12, carbon 13, and carbon 14. All the different isotopes, we average them up, and that will give us our atomic mass, or AMUs. So we have mentioned the periodic table before, and here we can see a periodic table with all the different elements on here. We mentioned that each element has a chemical symbol, and you can see the name here. We mentioned that the number of protons is going to be the atomic number. And then we talked about the different mass numbers. Mass numbers were the protons plus neutrons. And then we averaged them all together. So this is going to be the atomic mass right here for hydrogen. The interactive periodic table is a pretty neat website to check out. You could see all of the different elements and arranged on the table. The top row is going to have the smaller elements, hydrogen and helium. They're the smaller elements because they have the least amount of protons inside. Their atomic numbers are the smallest. And then you can see the atomic numbers get larger as we drop down in the rows. As you move from the left side to the right side, you can see the reactive elements moving all the way to the right side with the noble gases. If you click on the interactive periodic table, you can learn about each of these individual elements. So we could click on helium, for example, and it will pull up Wikipedia's history about it, discoveries about it, all sorts of interesting information that you can find out about each of the individual elements in the periodic table. So coming back to the elements and their subatomic particles, remember we said that the protons and the neutrons are always in the innermost part of an atom with the electrons around the outside. So the electrons are around the outside in shells, and we use this model called the Bohr model. The first inner shell is the closest to the nucleus, and it's labeled 1N. And this inner shell, if we have hydrogen as an example, hydrogen had one proton, and it had its corresponding electron whizzing around in the innermost shell on one end. If it was helium, helium had two protons, and it had a second electron swirling around out there. After we get past two electrons, then we're going to move into the second shell, this outer shell here, and that shell can carry more electrons. This shell can carry up to eight electrons. Same with the third shell, it can also carry up to eight electrons. No matter what element you have, the furthest shell on the outside, the shell that is going to be exposed, whether it is this one or this one or this one, that outermost shell is going to be called the valence shell. So depending on what's going on with that valence shell depends on how reactive an element might be. Remember that valence shell is the outermost layer, so it depends on how many electrons that this element has in its valence shell, whether or not it will be reactive. We can see hydrogen only has one ele uh, electron in its valence shell, and to fill this valence shell, it needs two. So hydrogen is very reactive. When we compare it to helium over here, helium has two in its valence shell, so its valence shell is full. If the valence shell is full, it is called inert, and it's not reactive. Over here, we can see helium valence shell has two electrons in the layer. And remember, that shell was 1N. Over here on 2N, these valence shells, any shell 2N or higher, has two, four, six, eight electrons. 
this valence shell is full with all eight electrons, it is full, it is inert. If the valence shell can hold eight electrons, it's called the octet rule. So every shell from 2n and higher can hold up to eight electrons via the octet rule. If, it, if the valence shell is full, again, it is inert. If it is not full, then it will be reactive. We can see over here lithium only has one electron in that valence shell, so this guy is very reactive. Chloride has seven of its eight. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons, and it's missing an eighth, so this guy may want to pull electrons from another substance. So these guys are very reactive. Remember we talked that every element is electrically neutral. It should have a proton to balance out with an electron. So the protons and electrons are the same with an electrically neutral atom. But what if they're not? What if we lose an electron or we gain an electron? If we have an imbalance, then we have a charged particle. And those charged particles are called ions. There are two different types of ions. For positively charged ions, these are called cations. And cations have lost an electron. So therefore their protons, the positive protons, outweigh the negative electrons since we lost one. So for example, we talked about sodium. And sodium has this one lone electron in its valence shell. If sodium loses that electron, if this electron gets transferred to something else, now it's missing that electron there. So we have an imbalance of power. We have more positive protons than we have electrons. So we have, sodium has a positive charge or a plus one. If you lose more than one electron, you might have a positive two or a positive three charge written for that element. Cations have lost an electron, therefore they have a net positive charge. If you can remember cats have paws, they are positively positive, hopefully that will help you remember. Cations have lost an electron and they have a positive charge. While their counterpart, anions, have gained an electron. So we had mentioned that chloride had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons in its valence shell. And according to the octet rule, we need eight to be full. So chloride wants another electron right here so it can fill up its valence shell and be full. So chloride is going to be very reactive. And here we can see that chloride wanted something here and it took an electron, it gained an electron and it put it there to fill up its valence shell. So if it has gained an electron, now it has, instead of equal numbers of positive protons and negative electrons, it's gained an electron. It's got a negative charge. So in this case, chloride has a charge of negative one. It gained one electron. But again, it may not be just one electron. Maybe it's gaining more than one electron. Maybe it's gaining two or three. No matter how many electrons it gains, if it has an overall negative charge, it is called an anion. Anions are negatively charged ions.